as we're going through the rest of this conversation, I feel like there's a w- one thing that your books often do for me is like they unlock mental models. And so we've got a mental model of the naive view of information. The thing that maybe <clears throat> starts to solve that is self-correcting mechanisms. So we've yes. got that piece. And we've got another mo- mental model of the populist view of information, which is too nihilistic. It's too cynical. I mean, look at what we've created. If that was true, we could never have a city like New York City yeah. or a nation state. Like, so that clearly also can't be true. Now what I'd like to do is go through uh, back, back in history. And you said one of the things earlier in our conversation that one of the most useful things we can actually do is understand our information networks. Mm-hmm. So I wanna go back in history so that we can anticipate and take some lessons into the next information network, which is basically the network that we're living in, the computer age. Yeah. But before we get there, let's do a brief history of information networks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for me, there, there was a game, you've all used to play all the time, it's called Civilization. Oh yeah. Okay. No, no, yeah. I don't know if you've ever played this. Yes. Basically, you start with some land and some resources and your civilization has to unlock a tech tree. And so at each stage of, of progress, you might unlock something like mathematics. And mathematics leads to physics and that eventually leads to you know nuclear reactors and that kind of capability. And that's sort of how I see, that's my mental model for your books. It's basically mm-hmm. like you're, you're talking about these uh, information network upgrades that humanity has unlocked to allow them to coordinate and scale civilizations. So let's talk about the first. And th- this was uh, like kind of in your book, Sapiens, really, which mm-hmm. is like the original homo sapiens technology that came about through language. Uh, and that is really the story. Yeah. Is the original information network that set our species apart from the Neanderthals and the chimpanzees and the entire animal kingdom. When did humans start telling stories? We don't know for sure, but the evidence points at around 70,000 years ago, 60, 70,000 years ago, that we start seeing larger numbers of Homo sapiens cooperating. And at the same time, we start seeing uh, art, new kinds of art, like cave paintings. And we start seeing evidence of religion, like complex burials. And, uh, and we don't have any written evidence, of course, so we are not sure. But you know, before about 70,000 years ago, There were Homo sapiens, but like Neanderthals, they only cooperated in very small groups, like 50 people. How do you know that? From archaeology. Hmm. You look at the tools made by Homo sapiens and Neanderthals from about 100,000 years ago. You see that the tools are mostly made from local material. Material from like you find a, a, a stone knife, It's made from locally available stones. But then 50,000 years ago, in Homo sapiens archaeological sites, you start seeing tools that are made from stones and seashells and other material from hundreds of kilometers away. You know, with seashells, it's easy to know what, what, and like you find an archaeological site in the center of Europe, and there is a seashell from the Mediterranean. But today, with, with advanced chemistry, Even if you find like a a flint knife, you can tell exactly where the flint was sourced. And you see that it's sometimes sourced from 300 kilometers away, a thousand kilometers away. So this indicates some kind of trade or exchange between different human bands. Now, how do you exchange or trade flint with people you don't really know, people from another band? You don't see chimpanzees do it. You don't see evidence for that with Neanderthals. We think about trade as something natural. Oh, of course, it's good for me, it's good for you, let's trade. If that was so, why is it that no other animal except Homo sapiens trades? Because interest is not enough. You need trust. In order to trade with somebody, you need to trust them. Now, the biggest question uh, in, in trade and in much of human history is how do you trust strangers? It's easy to trust your own band members, family, friends. How do you trust strangers? And this is where stories come. Stories are a technology to create trust between strangers. Hmm. Like 
I believe in this big spirit. You believe in the same spirit. I don't know you personally, but because we both believe in the same spirit, I trust you. And how do, you, do, how do I know that you believe in the same spirit as me? Maybe you have some kind of uh, 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 distinctive headgear that indicates that you believe in the same spirit as me. So now if you lo log on the streets of New York, you will see it. People going with different funny hats <laughs> and the hats telling like uh, the two Jews that never met in their life, they immediately know, oh, he's also Jewish. Why? Because he has the same funny hat that I'm wearing. <laughs> so I can trust him or her, which means that there is a basis also for economic cooperation. And uh, it's, no, it's no, no, no wonder that, you know, you look at the American dollar, it's not the Stone Age, it's also the modern era. You look at the American, the US dollar, what's written on it in God we trust. There is no dollar without some God or some mythology. So like in China, they don't have God, so they have Chairman Mao on all the Remnibi. Uh, and in, in Mao, we trust. He's the ancestral spirit. And if I trust Mao and you trust Mao, we can cooperate. If you enjoyed all of that, then you'll absolutely love the Bankless newsletter. Join over 300,000 fellow readers, all for free. Click below to sign up.